message from Goodwill and the Ad Council. You're listening to BostonFreeRadio.com. Hello and welcome to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Just as a reminder, Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching and listening on Somerville Community Access Television or some community TV station that's kind enough to pick up this broadcast. To them, I say thank you. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. And I'm back on this show after two weeks. Yeah, I, my last show I did two weeks ago. The Tuesday before this one, I couldn't come in to do my show, even if I wanted to. The studios were closed because of a huge nor'easter, the likes of which we here in Boston have not seen. But I'm back, I'm ready to discuss movies, and I'm going to start the show the way I normally started off, with my segment, What's Topping the Box Office? The top 10 highest grossing films of this past weekend. And number one at the box office for an unprecedented fifth week in a row is Black Panther. And what's amazing about this is Star Wars The Last Jedi, which made a just slightly more money than Black Panther has so far, was only number one at the box office for two weeks. That, that, that's crazy. I don't know how that, that is. But this weekend, Black Raider grossed a decent $26.7 million. But that's nothing compared to how much it's grossed in its fifth week total. So, here in the United States, it's grossed $605 million. Around the world, it has grossed $1.185 billion. So, it goes without saying, on a budget of $200 million, that Black Panther is, indeed, a certified hit here in the States and around the world. And that's not going to change. Tomb Raider is the number one highest grossing debut movie of the week, but it's number two at the box office, having grossed a decent $23.6 million here in the States, a very impressive $128.8 million worldwide, and that's against a budget of $90 million. So Tomb Raider still has a long way to go to recoup its budget here in the States. So it's not a hit yet here, but around the world it is already a certified hit, probably thanks largely in part due to Alicia Vikander's international appeal. But, of course, we'll be talking about the movie Tomb Raider as well as four other new films later on in the show. I Can Only Imagine is a movie I have never heard of until I saw it in the top ten this week, but it debuted at number three and the number two highest grossing debut movie of the week, and it grossed $17.1 million here in the States against a budget of $7 million. So even though it has no chance of hitting number one at the box office at this point, especially with Black Panther still at the box office, it is already a certified hit here in the States. I don't know how... Well, it's done overseas, but it doesn't really matter because if it's a certified hit here in the States, it is vicariously a certified hit worldwide. A Wrinkle in Time is number four at the box office, sliding from number two last week. A Wrinkle in Time grossed $16.3 million. Against a budget of $110 million, though, A Wrinkle in Time has so far grossed $60.8 $60.8 million here in the States and $71.7 million worldwide, which means it's not a hit yet here in the States or around the world, but will it get there? Maybe it'll eke its way to being a tentative hit, but we'll, of course, have to see. It's not off to a great start so far. Love, Simon is the number three highest grossing debut movie of the week and the number five movie at the box office this weekend. Love, Simon grossed $11.8 million in the United States against a budget of $17 million. So it's not a hit yet, but it's off to a really great start, especially given its budget. And I don't have the international numbers for you for this movie either. Game Night is number six of the box office this weekend, sliding slightly from number five last week. Game Night this weekend grossed $5.6 million, but against a budget of $37 million, which is quite modest, Game Night has so far grossed $54.2 million here in the States and $84.7 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is already a certified hit. That I actually didn't see coming. 
Peter Rabbit is still in the top 10, especially since Easter is coming. And while it's not in the top five, it's still at a decent number seven, falling from number six last week. Not a huge fall, but still pretty significant. It grossed $5.2 million this past weekend against a budget of $50 million. That's five zero million million. Peter Rabbit has so far grossed $102.4 million here in the States and $146 million worldwide. So it may actually do better on Easter weekend. Uh, you, you might see it climb a little bit, do, uh, doing exactly what The Greatest Showman did for the last couple of months. It might, but I'm not guaranteeing that's going to happen. But either way, it is a good time of the year to be the Peter Rabbit movie, but it is a certified hit here in the States and around the world, regardless of whether it survives into Easter weekend, which is two weekends from now. The Strangers, Pray at Night, in its second week of release, is number eight at the box office, taking a huge drop from number three last week, but it grossed $4.7 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $5 million, The Strangers, Pray at Night, has so far grossed $18.5 million. Now, this is a movie I have not seen yet, and considering I didn't see the original Strangers, I probably will skip this one. I don't know how the reviews are, judging from the huge drop it had at the box office the reviews probably weren't great at least the word of mouth reviews but that being said it's already grossed more than three times its budget in just two weeks and even if it never hits number one again it is already a certified hit here in the states around the world i don't know Red Sparrow also took a huge drop. Last week it was number four at the box office. This week it's number nine at the box office, having grossed $4.5 million. Now this one is probably going to be a bomb. Against a budget of $69 million, Red Sparrow has so far grossed $39.7 million here in the States and $106.2 million worldwide, making it not even close to being even a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is tentative so far. Probably it being it taking place in Russia added to its international appeal but I'm just speculating. And finally, number 10 at the box office is Death Wish, which, like Red Sparrow, was in theater, is in theaters for, or has been in theaters for three weeks. This weekend, it grossed $3.4 million. Against a budget of $30 million, it has so far grossed $30 million here in the States and $37.3 million worldwide, making it a tentative hit here in the States and around the world. And it is unlikely we're going to see Death Wish in the top 10 next week, but it's, it eats its way to being a tentative hit, so that's something. Come on, smile. Oh, honey, he's still not smiling. Maybe he's not a smiler. Yeah, maybe he's just not a happy baby. Maybe he's just being a boy. Or maybe he's teething. Maybe it's just a phase. Maybe he has autism, and we can definitely do something to help. Maybe is all you need to find out more about autism. No big, joyful smiles by six months is one early sign. Learn the others at AutismSpeaks.org slash signs. Brought to you by Autism Speaks and the Ad Council. Hi, I'm Pierce. And I'm Calvin. And are you tired of fake news? Yes. So tired. Sorry, were you asking me? I was just in general. Oh, well, I, yeah, yeah. I'm... I can only speak for me. I'm really tired of so, fake news. Yeah, me too. So, good thing is we run a radio Oh, that's right. Radio we, show. Right. We have a radio show where we uh, try to debunk fake news. We try to cut through all the all the oh, crap. Crap. Yeah. Because there's a lot of it. Uh-huh. And we're trying to bring you f- straight facts. Straight facts. Oh, it's called Fact Up. It's Our show's called Fact Up. It's not called Straight Facts. facts. No. The show is called... Fact up. up. And it's Mondays at 2 p.m. and it's an hour long. Yeah, only on BFR. <coughs> Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and I'm getting right into my first film, Tomb Raider. And actually, I've got a whole bunch of movies, some big, some small, but all of them I have not reviewed yet, and I still have a a stack of films that I need to review for this show. I'm starting with Tomb Raider because it's new this week, and it's the only new movie I've seen. In addition to that, it, it debuted at number two at the box office, So that is really not all that bad. So Tomb Raider is, I guess you could call it a remake. I would call it a franchise reboot. It is based on the video game of the same name starring 
the the iconic video game character Lara Croft. And they did actually make, of course, a Tomb Raider movie, which was called Lara Croft Tomb Raider in 2001, which starred Angelina Jolie. And I remember seeing that movie when it came out. It came out in June of 2001 when I was between my junior and senior year of high school. And even though I really liked Angelina Jolie back then, uh, while she was married to Billy Bob Thornton, before she was married to Brad Pitt and destroyed any chance chances I could have of being with her, but I'm just kind of putting that to the side there. I wasn't all that impressed with Lara Croft Tomb Raider. I remember a couple of scenes from it. I remember it had a great soundtrack by the likes of U2 and Nine Inch Nails putting some great songs into that movie, but the movie itself was somewhat forgettable. I remember there was a shower scene in the movie. I remember some of the action, but I always felt that Lara Croft Tomb Raider was trying to be James Bond or Indiana Jones. And even though Angelina Jolie at the time was really cool, she just didn't make Lara Croft Tomb Raider work. And I thought it was a lot of flash, a lot of action, but there was really no story or no original story behind Lara Croft Tomb Raider. So if I were to rate that 2001 movie now, I'd probably give it a strikeout. So Tomb Raider pretty much has nowhere to go but up. Of course, it is hard to follow Angelina Jolie in a, in a, in a role she... It took on, but Angelina Jolie unfortunately didn't make that role iconic. So I I have a rule with with remakes. In in other words, I have I have a rule that I wish movie studios would follow. Don't remake good movies remake bad movies. I think it was a terrible idea to remake Beauty and the Beast last year, but of course it made over a billion dollars, but even still, it wasn't all that great. But Tomb Raider really has nowhere to go but up. And this time, Lara Croft is played by Academy Award winner Alicia Vikander, and she is the fiercely independent daughter, Lara Croft is, of a missing adventurer who must push herself beyond her limits when she finds herself on the island where her father disappeared. So there's a lot of exposition in this movie, not unnecessary exposition, by the way, much very necessary exposition as to why Lara Croft's father, who in this movie is played by Dominic West, disappeared, and he is presumed by especially those people who are in charge of his estate, to be dead. But Lara Croft thinks otherwise. And what I really liked about Alicia Vikander's approach to Lara Croft in this movie is that she starts from the beginning and gets to the heart of what makes Lara Croft so unique as a character. And I don't think that's where Angelina Jolie's movie started off. She's you know, a no-holds-barred action hero who can take plenty of hits, but there's no backstory behind her, and I think that was a huge mistake for the first Lara Croft Tomb Raider movie to make. But I liked the fact that Alicia Vikander, as Lara Croft, starts from the beginning. It starts with her taking hits, excuse me, not taking hints, taking hits and being covered in bruises and also not being a perfect action hero and I, I, I really like that. I, I like how it shows the character coming into her own and th there's a lot to say about video game movies. In fact, whenever I've seen a video game movie, my my expectations have been kept relatively low. I think the best video game movie I've seen so far is Angry Birds. And the reason that's the best video game movie is, first of all, because it is far better, far, far better than any other video game movie that's come before it. But also, it knew its source material. It knew Angry Birds to be a silly video game. And it also took into account some of the rules of the Angry Birds universe. And I think Tomb Raider surpasses Angry Birds as the best video game movie, particularly because it doesn't focus exclusively on action. There is a lot of action here, but it focuses on character development. It develops a, the Lara Croft character. It tells you exactly where she started, where she's going, and 
how she becomes iconic. And I think that is a very good move. And maybe, arguably, they could have had a, a movie w- which was more action-filled and be- started the, the prequel a, a little while before, but I, I would argue that that was a bad choice, or that would have been a bad choice. Instead, what I liked was that Tomb Raider reintroduced you to Lara Croft. Now, I don't know if Tomb Raider has had a recent video game. I remember that when kids in high school had PlayStation 1s and 2s, that Tomb Raider was one of the most popular video games out there. To teenagers today, I don't know. Maybe they've rebooted the video game franchise. I'm, I'm really not sure. I pay more, a lot more attention to movies than I do new video games. I'm still kind of a Super Nintendo N64 kind of guy myself. I am an old school gamer. I get a rise out of old school games, but I do have an appreciation for the newer video games that, that come out. And of course, the video game industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, but not for no good reason. But Tomb Raider, I think, is so far the best video game movie, particularly for all the reasons I said. It's not entirely focused on action. It doesn't try to pander to the people who played the video game and want to, well, for lack of a better term, see somebody else, the moviegoers, play the video game for them. And I think that's the mistake that a lot of video game movies have made. So Tomb Raider, I don't know if this is going to be one of the best films of the year, but it was a lot better than I expected it to be. And it gets my rating of a knockout. And I especially loved Alicia Vikander as Lara Croft. And I would love to see her in the inevitable sequel. Hope you enjoyed your meal. And I just want to say, he's lucky to have a brother like you. Lucky. Caring for my brother is far from easy. But he's a part of me, like my arms and legs, so I'll be his. No time for tired. Nothing can disable this love. He needs me, but I'm the lucky one, even though I need help now and then. If you're caring for a loved one, visit aarp.org slash caregiving for care guides and community. Support for your strength. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. She Likes It Heavy on Tuesdays at 10 p.m. Eastern on bostonfreeradio.com. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next film I'm going to be reviewing for you is A Wrinkle in Time. This was the long-awaited adaptation, big screen adaptation that is, of the required junior high reading book that I read when I was in the sixth grade, and I absolutely loved it. It wasn't required reading. I read it for, for fun, and man, am I glad I did. It's one of those books that you have to read. It, it's along with The Catcher in the Rye, where I... But before... When I was reading in the sixth grade, there was no plans to adapt it into a movie, and that was fine with me because the the book was really great. But A Wrinkle in Time is adapted into a big screen movie for the first time by director Ava DuVernay. And I've been pronouncing her name Ava DuVernay, but she actually makes an introduction in the very beginning of the movie, at least in some theaters, where she actually pronounces her name as Ava. So that's what I'm going to go with from here on out. But with that said, even though I respect Ava DuVernay a lot and her her previous film, Selma, was great, and I think that's going to be seen even 10, 20 years from now as one of the greatest movies of this decade, A Wrinkle in Time was a disappointment. I think in terms of storytelling, it was a muddled mess. It had some pretty good special effects. I liked just about every person who was in the film, who was cast in the movie, but unfortunately, I think it was a very muddled story. I didn't quite get the three beings. I got them in the book. I got what their roles were, but here, exactly what their roles were, were completely muddled over. I also didn't appreciate that A Wrinkle in Time, the book, This is what I appreciated about the book. It was a mix of science fiction and fantasy, whereas in this movie, the science fiction was pushed to the side, and instead you had 
fantasy. And I don't think that worked particularly well for the big screen adaptation of A Wrinkle in Time. But what is A Wrinkle in Time about? For those of you who haven't read the book or seen the movie yet, it follows a girl named Meg who has a brother who's borderline autistic by the name of Charles Wallace and she also has a friend a a guy who's not her boyfriend but a very popular guy in school who is the opposite of her in that she is very unpopular and after the disappearance of her scientific father three particular three peculiar beings Mrs. What's It, played by Reese Witherspoon, Mrs. Who, played by Mindy Kaling, and Mrs. Witch, W H I C H, played by Oprah Winfrey, send Meg, Charles Wallace, and their friend Calvin. Okay, I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here. And, okay, <laughs> their friend to space in order to find him. So what's really not clear when I, when I was watching this film was that when these people were going from space to space or from world to world, that they were going into distant planets, not distant fantasy worlds. So I didn't really like that the, the science fiction elements of these were pretty much ignored or glanced over. And I didn't quite get that sense of wonder that I think it would have gotten if it had taken place in space. In addition to that, while I kind of liked the girl who played Meg, who is an actress by the name of Storm Reed, a very um, talented actress, I did feel like sometimes she was a little unnecessarily jaded, and also here she is jumping from world to world with her younger sibling, Charles Wallace, played by Derek McCabe, and her love interest, or maybe slightly unrequited love interest, Calvin, played by Levi Miller, and she's kind of looking around and is not particularly taken with these other worlds. She doesn't have any sense of wonder or even really any sense of fear. And also, while I liked Oprah Winfrey as Mrs. Witch, I didn't exactly think that Reese Witherspoon was particularly well cast as Mrs. What's It. I did appreciate that Reese Witherspoon was at least trying to be another character besides the one she usually plays in romantic comedies. She's trying to be a little bit whimsical, but she missed the mark. But I do appreciate her trying. And Mindy Kaling as Mrs. Who is probably the biggest letdown because all she basically did as a character was just recite quotes from other people. And that's pretty much it. She recites quotes from everyone from Stephen Hawking to Shakespeare to Outcast, which I think is a clever character trait, but... As she was doing this, I was kind of wondering, well, what do these beings do? If, if they're so powerful and they can take these three kids from world to world, why don't they just rescue Meg's father? They, they seem to have the power to do that more so than these moral beings from Earth. In the book, that's explained extremely well. In the movie, it's not. So, unfortunately, even though this movie has some very excellent special effects, I feel like, very much like other disappointing sci-fi movies over, over the last 20 years, I feel as though the special effects overpowered the overall story. And I also have the feeling that Ava DuVarnay probably fell victim to what a lot of white male directors fall victim to in Hollywood too much studio interference and i wouldn't have thought that disney would not be the studio that subjects their filmmakers to such studio interference but unfortunately this movie proves that studio interference is probably still a thing even in a more revered company like walt disney so while the acting was decent, I have to give this movie a very reluctant strikeout. It's a movie that didn't re- that missed the mark several times. I couldn't exactly identify with 
the main characters, especially Meg, whereas I could sympathize with her a lot more in the book. Again, I haven't seen the 2003 TV movie, which is based on A Wrinkle in Time, but I do have to say that if this movie were better, I would probably await the inevitable sequel, A A Swiftly Tilting Planet, but as of now, especially given the numbers it's made and the bad word of mouth, I don't think this movie is going to get any sort of sequel. 180 over 111, and I had a stroke. I couldn't speak or walk. 150 over 90, and I had a stroke. This is what high blood pressure sounds like. You might not feel its symptoms, but the results from a stroke are far from silent. Get back on your treatment plan or talk with your doctor to create a plan that works for you. Go to loweryourhpp.org. I had to tell everything's changed. Brought to you by the American Stroke Association, American Medical Association, and the Ad Council. Diane Wong here announcing a new radio program. Let's talk about race. From our beginnings as a white supremacist society to our current existence as a white supremacist society. Race is a topic that affects us all, and yet we have difficulty talking about it. Why is race so difficult? Why can't we talk openly about white supremacy? Why don't we like to talk about white privilege? Why is internalized oppression shrouded in mystery? What about lynching? What about gerrymandering and the current Black Lives Matters debate? We'll talk about all of it. Come and join us Thursdays from 7 to 8 p.m. Let's talk about race. Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Game Night. This is the latest starring Jason Bateman and Rachel McAdams, and it's directed by John Francis Daly and Jonathan Goldstein, who brought us... Horrible Bosses, which also starred Jason Bateman. And this is a comedy about a group of friends who meet regularly for game nights who find themselves entangled in a real-life mystery. This is a movie that actually kind of reminded me of the Bill Murray film The Man Who Knew Too Little from 1997. But unlike The Man Who Knew Too Little, Game Night is actually quite a bit funnier. It also has the R-rated freedom that The Man Who Knew Too Little didn't. I, I think that one of the problems with the man who knew too little is though is that even though bill murray was funny in parts the the whole movie i i think probably would have been geared more towards adults than a family movie and i think that because of that confusion of what audience it wanted it didn't do especially well critically or commercially but in this movie max and annie jason bateman and rachel mcadams respectively are two fiercely competitive game players who are married and they actually meet at a trivia night at a bar one time and there's there's a pretty good exposition that's leading to how they met and what makes them a good match for one another and they certainly are a good match and when you when the the movie starts to get going, there is a particular game night they play with a number of friends of theirs, including Ryan, who is a who is a mooch, who's played by Billy Magnuson, who has a, a habit of dating various women who are far out of his league, both in terms of looks and in terms of mental capacity. And he also has. And they also have two other friends, Kevin, who's played by Lamorne Morris, and Michelle, who's played by Kylie Bunbury. And Kevin is about to be married to Michelle, but is also convinced that Michelle cheated on him at one point. And there's a running gag with that that's pretty clever. And there's also a creepy next-door neighbor by the name of Gary, who's played in this movie in his first comedic role that I know of by Jesse Plemons. Jesse Plemons, best known for movies such as... Well, I, I know him primarily from Breaking Bad, but he was also in... He also had some good supporting roles in movies like Black Mass, starring Johnny Depp, which I, I think is a criminally underrated movie, and The Master, which was directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, starring Philip Seymour Hoffman and Joaquin Phoenix, amongst other people. But things get interesting in this particular game night when Brooks, who's played, uh, who is Max's brother, 
who's played by Kyle Chandler, comes to visit, and there is a little bit of bad blood between Max and Brooks. I'm not sure if there's a, a, a play on words there with Jason Bateman's character n- being named Max and his brother Kyle Chandler being named Brooks. I'm not sure if there's if that was an intentional nod to Max Brooks, uh, who is a... <laughs> who's a writer and who's also the son of Mel Brooks. And I mean, I'm not sure if there's a connection there, but either way, it was, it was kind of clever if, if there was a connection, but I think it's mainly coincidental. But anyway, Brooks has this, this group of six friends play another more intense game besides Trivial Pursuits and Charades. And f- to this movie's credit, they... They begin to enact a mystery that feels like a very intense mystery. And the reason I compared it to The Man Who Knew Too Little is because, well, that's the only movie I could think of at the the moment, but also it's where the line between it being a regular game and it being a a real murder mystery begins to get blurred. And there there are some other movies besides The Man Who Knew Too Little who that, that do this pretty well but game night actually had me really intrigued and there were some very good laugh out loud moments there's particularly one scene in the movie that involves chelsea peretti who plays a an office worker for the game company that or so these characters think put them into this game and i can't give away exactly what chelsea peretti does that's really funny but when when she comes on the screen i immediately laughed out loud there's some pretty good laugh out loud moments in this i do think the characters are a little rehashed i didn't think billy magnuson's character was particularly original jesse Plemons' character wasn't original either but at least he was intriguing and he brought something new to what otherwise would have been a creepy neighbor role and there were also some surprisingly shocking moments involving Jesse Plemons' character. And also the the husband who's convinced his wife cheated on him at least once. That's kind of been done before as well. But I did think that Jason Bateman, Rachel McAdams, and Kyle Chandler brought at least a lot more originality to their roles that probably made up for the other tropes in the film. And I thought that overall the characters acted together pretty well. And as I said, there are some shocking moments and there are many other surprisingly funny moments. And I thought that there were a lot more comedic hits in this movie than there were misses and also i could totally buy jason bateman and rachel mcadams as players who go ahead hell for leather when it comes to these kind of games and honestly i'd love to know people like this in real life but game night is a movie that probably is not as original as horrible bosses but it is fortunately enjoyable and when it it's funny it's really funny and when it's shocking it's very shocking and i think probably about 70 to to 80 percent of either the shocking moments or the funny moments hit pretty well and it also had a very focused story which i certainly appreciated the end the, the shock of the film kind of fizzled out. But overall, it's a movie to which I give my rating of a checkout. I think it's a movie that may not particularly be worth seeing in theaters necessarily. But I think that for a, a movie at home with a group of friends, this is definitely one of those movies to watch. And there wasn't a lot here that was particularly quotable either. But again, this is a film that you could watch on video on demand um, when it comes out in a couple of months on a Friday night or a Saturday night and it'll be a lot of fun for a stay in movie and I have the feeling this movie will probably pick up as that video on demand go to movie for years to come I'm a 40 year old man that walked in there to get his high school diploma it was very hard for me but Miss Araceli she gave me direction at age 47 Marco finished his high school diploma 50% of getting your high school diploma is walking through those doors. The other 50% is doing the work. No one gets a diploma alone. If you're thinking of finishing your high school diploma, you have help. Find free adult education classes near you at finishyourdiploma.org. That's finishyourdiploma.org. Brought to you by the Dollar General Literacy Foundation and the Ad Council.
this is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Red Sparrow. This is the latest starring Jennifer Lawrence. It is based on a book of the same name by Jason Matthews, and it is directed by Francis Lawrence, who has actually directed a number of music videos, some iconic from the late 90s. He directed Gone Till November by Wyclef Jean. He directed uh, Waiting for Tonight by Jennifer Lawrence. Lopez. He directed a number of Destiny's Child and Beyonce music videos. But in terms of films, he's directed uh, Constantine, which is a cult movie starring Keanu Reeves. He directed the controversial remake I Am Legend, which is based on a book of the same name, but also a remake of The Last Man on Earth, starring Vincent Price, and The Omega Man, starring Charlton Heston. Which And I Am Legend wasn't quite as well-reviewed as those other movies, but Francis Lawrence also directed three out of the four Hunger Games movies, namely Catching Fire and Mockingjay Part 1 and 2. So he is reuniting with Jennifer Lawrence for the fourth time in this movie, as Jennifer Lawrence plays ballerina Dumb Dominika Igorova. <laughs> I love saying that name. I'll say it again. Dominika Igorova, who is living in what is presumed to be modern day Russia. And Russia was our ally for about 20 five years but unfortunately well they're back to being our enemies again but the good news about that is that at least we have an an enemy for these kinds of foreign espionage movies and they don't necessarily have to take place in the 60s 70s or 80s anymore i guess but in any in any event this ballerina Dominika Igorova, who's played by jennifer lawrence is after a career ending injury Uh, with her ballet dancing, is recruited to Sparrow School, which is a Russian intelligence service where she is forced to use her body as a weapon. Her first mission, targeting a CIA agent, threatens to unravel the security of both nations. So, Jennifer Lawrence is okay in this film. I do have to say that one of the worst parts about her performance is her Russian accent. Sometimes it bordered on being Natasha of Boris and Natasha, and other times she just fell flat and retreated back to her American accent mid-sentence. It happens in this movie a lot, but what really killed me about this film is even though I think Jennifer Lawrence, other than her accent, does a serviceable job, the story is so much As I was watching this movie, I was just completely confused by it. And I do have to admit that even though I see a lot of espionage spy movies, some of them I get, some of them really confuse me. And as I was sitting in the theater, I was having a little bit of a a panicking feeling because I thought to myself, should I pretend to go along with this movie and come back on the air and tell you people who are listening that... This is a very smart film, or should I call it for what it is, confusing? And sometimes I can't get that impression when I'm sitting in the theater watching the film. It's almost kind of like a Monday morning quarterback. I have to think about the movie I just saw. And as I think about Red Sparrow, I think that the, the emperor is naked. 
There is really not a lot here. There are so many tropes that have been used in countless other spy movies before, and the plot is so confusing. But as the movie introduces a number of other characters in this film, by the likes played by the likes of Mary Louise Parker and Sierra Hines and Jolie Richardson, I just couldn't keep track of what was going on. I didn't get a sense of what the story was, and overall, I just threw my hands up in the air and said, "Okay." I don't get this film. And by the time the movie ended and you realized what the twist was, I wasn't shocked by it at all. Sometimes I go along with the movie, I get a little confused, I don't quite know where it's going, but by the end, the ending ties everything together. But in this movie, the ending explains some things, and there certainly is a twist, but I didn't think it was as good a twist because I wasn't particularly invested in the characters. And plus, when the plot synopsis says that this this ballerina played by Jennifer Lawrence, and I quote, is forced to use her body as a weapon, end quote, I thought that would be literal, as in her body would kill people, you know? She would use some intricate ballet moves and swat away her enemies. I, I, I could only think of the swat away as, as a verb there and an adverb. But truthfully, she doesn't kill anybody with her body, and she doesn't... She doesn't particularly fight in any particularly original ways which you would expect would a ballerina would at least use some originality in her movements or use some sort of grace and admittedly i'm not sure if it was a body double who was in the ballet dancing scene in the very beginning but whether or not it was I have to give credit to the editors, if, if the, it was in fact a body double, for making the ballet dancing seem so seamless, or if it wasn't a body double, and I'm not sure if it was, I have to give Jennifer Lawrence credit for making me believe she was a ballerina. In addition to that, there are also some very confusing scenes. Like, there's one scene where a male recruit in her Sparrow School, in Jennifer Lawrence's character's Sparrow School, actually tries to rape Jennifer Lawrence. Now, that's an interesting scene. What is very dubious is the scene that follows afterwards where she tries to convince her instructor who's played by Charlotte Rampling, and her name is Matron in this film, that this rape occurred. And very confusingly, Jennifer Lawrence gets in front of the classroom, takes off all her clothes, and you do see her full frontal for those guys who've been dying to see Jennifer Lawrence naked. I guess that's one reason for you guys to see this film. But she, she strips down and she says to the guy, go ahead, you think you're a real man? do me now she she actually says this i'm i'm not quoting her verbatim but she definitely says something to this effect and of course the guy doesn't doesn't come on to her and i'm not saying that's unrealistic because being put on the spot that way would make anyone who even finds jennifer lawrence attractive very uncomfortable but red sparrow overall is a mess of the movie that sex scene in particular felt exploitative and red sparrow gets my rating of a strikeout it is a movie that disappointed me in a lot of ways but the acting i guess was decent Hi, I'm Danica Patrick. Watching my nieces grow, play, and learn is amazing, but not every child gets to be carefree. One in six kids in the U.S. are hungry. This breaks my heart, and it's something that Feeding America is working to change. Each year, the Feeding America network of food banks rescues billions of pounds of good food that would have gone to waste and gives it to families in need. To help, visit feedingamerica.org. Brought to you by Feeding America and the Ad Council. All this and more on Unpopular Music, Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. 
Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Downsizing. This is a movie that came out in theaters shortly before Christmas, and I did see it a little while after it was released in theaters, but I didn't get to review it for you guys because I had a bunch of special shows, and by the time I got around to reviewing it, it was out of theaters. So... I'm reviewing it today because Downsizing came out on DVD today, and it's actually available for streaming on Amazon Prime Video. And that's not a plug for Amazon. I'm, I'm just saying, in other words, Amazon didn't pay me to say it, and I'm not promoting Amazon when I say that, but if you were to watch it, you can get it on DVD or Blu-ray, or you can stream it live on Amazon. Whether or not it's on Netflix or Hulu, I don't know. But Downsizing is part science fiction and part social satire, in which a man realizes he would have a better life if he were to shrink himself to five inches tall, allowing him to live in wealth and splendor. How does that work? Well, the first part of the movie, the first third of the movie, explains really well why it might be beneficial for regular-sized human beings to shrink themselves down to slightly taller than a saltine cracker and i'm not i'm not exaggerating at all because i guess in terms of the environment as this movie explains i think very well shrinking yourself down to size would mean that you would consume fewer resources you would eat a lot less since maybe your metabolism is pretty good but half of a saltine cracker would probably make you full so there's that and you also can live in a seemingly big house because uh, a McMansion that w would be available in this downsized community would be about the size of a Lego mansion. So that would be also beneficial. Plus, you would be consuming, again, not just f food, but fewer resources like electricity, and therefore it wouldn't be as hazardous to the environment. You would have a far smaller carbon footprint. So these are all compelling reasons to shrink yourself down to size. Would I do it? Well, I like being six foot three and a half, so maybe not, but maybe as a as a last resort. But in, in any event, these reasons were good enough for Matt Damon's character, Paul Safranic, to shrink himself down to size, along with his wife Audrey, played by Kristen Wiig. And they do it when they find that a Friends of theirs, Dave and Carol Johnson, played by Jason Sudeikis and Marybeth Monroe, say that smaller is actually better. Maybe size matters, but not in the way you think. So the first half of the, excuse me, the first third of the movie is actually really good when Matt Damon shrinks himself down to size and the the way the procedure goes is first they shave off all your body hair and the parts where they actually showed the people in the film getting their getting their head shaved off made me immediately think of the very first scene of full metal jacket and as that scene was playing in my head i was thinking goodbye my sweetheart hello vietnam for those of you who remember the movie full metal jacket i don't know if that was intentional to pay homage to th that stanley kubrick movie but if director alexander payne wanted to make pay homage to that movie he certainly did right there so the second and third act of this movie is where I think the film falls apart because eventually Matt Damon begins to have a romantic relationship and an attraction to a Vietnamese refugee who also shrink her, sh shrunk herself down to size and got to this country illegally. Her name is Ngoc Lan Tran and she's played in this movie by Hong Chao. And I I was actually annoyed by this Vietnamese woman. I thought she came off more as a, a caricature than a compelling character. And I also didn't buy Matt Damon's character's attraction to her. And maybe that was the point of being unrequited, even though they, they share some intimate scenes together. But I just... I don't want to imitate her voice, but she sounded very much like an Asian caricature, like... Mickey Rooney's character in Breakfast at Tiffany's to me 
And I also thought that there were scenes that I wasn't sh- where she uttered such ridiculous dialogue that I wasn't quite sure whether she was me- whether she was supposed to be funny. Like, like for instance, she lives in a tenement building, a sh- shrunken sized tenement building, which kind of begs the question: What is the tenement building doing there? Why are there? poor people who are shrunk down to size isn't the point of being shrunk down to size to live a better lifestyle but there's that but she also has a roommate who is bedridden and when this roommate dies she basically says and i'm gonna i'm not gonna imitate her voice i don't want to be racist but she says oh yeah she dead you know and i'm thinking is that supposed to be funny oh i the the fact that she just that a person dies in front of her and she just dismisses it matter-of-factly? I don't know. And the third act is where this movie really just skid right off the rails. It delved into really just depressing territory where I think that downsizing as social satire actually could have had some funny parts. Like, for instance, if you live in a community with other people who are five inches tall, wouldn't vermin be a really big problem like rats would be the size of buffaloes so how would you keep rats and mice and even insects out of there i I, it just seemed like a very missed opportunity and alexander payne is a director who has proven that he can be funny his other films like election and about schmidt and citizen ruth certainly delved into very topical issues but in a very funny type of way but downsizing missed the mark and i think a lot of that had to do with hong chow's character apparently i'm not the only one to think this because hong chow was actually nominated for best supporting actress of the golden globes but i think there was a reason she wasn't nominated for an oscar because i didn't her her role just seemed very stereotypical to me so downsizing gets my rating of a strikeout again it's not going to be the worst film of the year for me even if it was it came out in 2017 not 2018 but i was disappointed by this film it could have tackled so many other topics and not have been depressing and also some of the ways these characters act are completely illogical so downsizing is a disappointment presents multiple choice parenting you've messed up your daughter's haircut do you a get spiritual mom where's the mirror beauty is within Oh. B. Find the positives. Less time blow drying, more time texting. Or C. Show empathy. Mom, you really don't have twinsies. I kind of love it. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of teens in foster care will love you just the same. For more information on adoption, visit adoptuskids.org. A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Adopt U.S. Kids, and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tune that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and now that I've reviewed five movies that I told you I'd review for the show, and I'm just playing a little bit of catch-up with the number of movies that I've seen, it's now time for me to get into my next segment, which is What's Coming Out Next. These are the big movies, unless stated otherwise, that are coming out in a theater near you, unless stated otherwise, this coming weekend. The biggest movie to come out in theaters this weekend is Pacific. Pacific Rim Uprising. Now, instead of Guillermo del Toro directing this movie, who directed the original Pacific Rim, the director is now Stephen S. DeKnight. And this is a movie about a character named Jake Pentecost, who is the son of Stacker Pentecost. And by the way, Jake Pentecost is played by John Boyega, whereas Stacker Pentecost in the original Pacific Rim was played by Idris Elba. But anyway, Jake Pentecost reunites with Mako Mori to lead a new generation of Jaeger pilots, including rival Lambert and 15-year-old hacker Amara, against a new kaiju threat. So Pacific Rim is a movie that came out years ago. I think it came out in 2015. 
let me oh, it actually came out in 2013 long before i had my show so i missed pacific rim when it came out in theaters so for that reason unless i see pacific rim this week and i can't guarantee that i will i'm going to probably miss pacific rim uprising but i do have the feeling that this film will take the place of black panther as number one at the box office and I think that's just kind of inevitable. I'm probably not going to see Pacific Rim Uprising uh, unless I see Pacific Rim first. So I'm not discouraging you guys from seeing it. It looks excellent. And with John Boyega in the lead, it certainly is promising. The movie also stars, by the way, Scott Eastwood, Kaylee Spanny, and Burn Gorham, amongst other actors. So that movie's coming out this Friday, and... Moving on to the next movie. This movie I will definitely see. This one is called... (laughs) Let me tell you what it is. It's Isle of Dogs. It's the newest animated film from director Wes Anderson and is set in Japan, and the Isle of Dogs follows a boy's odyssey in search of his dog. This movie has a renowned all-star cast in it. It features the voice talents of Brian Cranston, Edward Norton, Bill Murray, Greta Gerwig, and s- several other actors. I don't know how this movie's going to be. It looks like it's going to be very well animated, and it's the stop motion animation that Wes Anderson employed in his adaptation of The Fantastic Mr. Fox, which was based on a book of the same name by Roald Dahl. And amongst the writing credits, Wes Anderson wrote the story, and he was also assisted by Roman Coppola, who's been in the news for a number of reasons. Uh, Not very good reasons, but not her fault. But Isle of Dogs is a movie I will definitely see next week, and I will let you know what I think when I see the film. Another film that's coming out in a theater near you, probably, is one called Unsane. Not insane, Unsane. It's from director Steven Soderbergh, and it's about a young woman, played by Emily Blunt, who is involuntarily committed to a mental institution where she is confronted by her greatest fear. But is it real or a product of her delusion? So, I did catch a glimpse of, of, I'm I'm sorry, I just got a little startled by the, by the, by the image on the screen. I did catch a glimpse of a preview of this, of this movie. I try not to see previews, but this one came to me on YouTube, so I did get a glimpse of what the fear that this woman has is but i will not tell you so in the trailers this mo- this woman looks a lot like emily blunt and i thought it was emily blunt but it's actually an actress named claire foy who is like emily blunt also from england and she's been in she was she's actually a regular on the netflix series the crown which i haven't seen but she was also in vampire academy from 2014 she was in the movie breathe from last year which i also didn't see and this movie looks really interesting and considering it's from steven soderbergh it has a good chance of being good so that's a movie i will see for next week's show and i will let you know what i think when i see it but in the meantime before next week's show i'm actually going to attend one of my favorite all-time film festivals the boston underground film festival i have a press pass this year i'm really excited to see some underground films and i will definitely review those movies for you and tell you what i think what you should see what you should skip for next week's show but in the meantime that just about does it for words on film for this show remember that words on film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures and the views and opinions expressed on the show are solely those of your host and movie critic dan burke and they do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of any employees who are employed at the station to which you are catching this broadcast or the station as a whole with that said i've had a great time reviewing movies for you and until next week this is dan burke saying i'll see you you at the movies.